Introduction This is the second of a series of videos responding to the Amateur Exegetes blog post on my comments in Religious Learning Program podcast number 6 on the subject of Satan and demons in the New Testament. This video examines the second temple period context of specific terms and concepts found in the New Testament covering these topics. 1. Research Methodology 2. Second Temple Period Dualism 3. New Testament Hamartiology 4. Preliminary Remarks on New Testament Exorcism 5. Preliminary Remarks on New Testament Satan and Demons Use the timestamps in the video description to navigate the content. My previous video didn't drop any serious bombshells on Ben's case, though I think some of the content may have surprised people. From correspondence with Ben, I know it has piqued his interest, which is very satisfying to me. On his blog, Ben has also made a brief but very gracious comment on my first video, which I encourage you to read. See the link in the video description. I realise that Ben and other viewers are very eager to see me lay out my case, but I'll need to beg for your patience first so I can spend some time discussing interpretive methodology, the methods used in scholarship to determine the meaning of texts, referred to commonly in biblical studies as hermeneutics. I'm afraid this needs to be a long video because I can't just cite a list of scholars who support my position and say, well, they agree with me. Likewise, I can't just cite the same passages as Ben and say, well, I have a different view. I interpret them this way. I need to show my process of reasoning so it can be scrutinized by others and tested for validity. This is textual interpretation, so it's not exactly a science, but I do need to demonstrate I'm using academically recognized interpretive strategies which don't privilege my own personal bias. Again, since this is a long video, I'll remind you that I've placed timestamps in the video description if you want to jump between the sections instead of watching it from start to finish. Research Methodology In the previous video, I presented Ben's case and explained his reasoning. This is a summary. 1. Ben believes Jesus, Paul, and the Gospel writers held to an apocalyptic worldview which means they believed in a present evil world age, which would eventually be replaced by a future divinely good world age. 2. In support of this, Ben cited New Testament texts identifying an apocalyptic world view, and also cited mainstream scholarship showing this was a well-established position. 3. Ben further believes that the New Testament writer's world view was a cosmological apocalyptic world view so he believes they attributed the origin of evil and sin to supernatural evil forces and saw life's central conflict as a battle of opposing supernatural forces, such as Satan and demons on one side, and God and his faithful angels on the other. 4. In support of this, Ben cited references to demons and Satan in the Gospels and references to Satan in Paul's writings. Let's look at Ben's methodology in detail. On screen now is a flowchart I've made to demonstrate how he arrived at his conclusion. We'll read it from right to left, starting with his conclusion and then working backwards to see how he arrived at it. Note, of course, that this is not what Ben did. He worked from the evidence forward to his conclusion, as anybody should. I'm just doing this for the sake of convenience because it's easier to see how he reached his conclusions. As we can see, Ben explained that Jesus and Paul may have held to a forensic apocalyptic worldview, in which the final conflict of the world is between God and his angels on the one side, and evil humans on the other, or a cosmological apocalyptic worldview, in which the final conflict of the world is between God and his angels on the one side, and evil supernatural beings such as Satan, fallen angels, and demons on the other. How did he reach this conclusion? Well, if we move back up the flowchart, we can see that he previously had to decide if Jesus and Paul held a forensic dualism, attributing evil and sin to humans, or a cosmological dualism, attributing evil and sin to supernatural evil beings. 
Finn concluded that Jesus and Paul held a cosmological dualism. So how did he reach that conclusion? If we move further back up the flowchart, we can see Ben previously concluded that Jesus and Paul held to an apocalyptic eschatology in which the current age comes to a dramatic end in a moment of great conflict, as mentioned previously. And he also came to the conclusion that their lexicography, the words they used when discussing the origin and cause of evil and sin, was cosmological. This means that Ben took note of words used by Jesus and Paul, such as Satan, the devil, and demons, as well as references to exorcism, and concluded that these words referred to supernatural evil beings. As we can see, this had a significant impact on how he reached his final conclusions. He writes, quote, While at times these tracks overlap, it is in the former that we find the origins of the demonic spirits that plague Mark's conceptual world, end quote. And further, quote, These and other references to Satan found in Paul sound, at least to this amateur exegete, like references to a personal being, end quote. So for Ben, the presence of these words used by Jesus and Paul is decisive. They refer clearly to supernatural beings to whom Jews of the Second Temple period typically attributed evil and sin. Additionally, the New Testament writers speak of these beings as being in conflict with God and Christ, indicating a worldview in which the main conflict is between evil and good supernatural powers, otherwise described as cosmological dualism. Ben identifies the dualism of Jesus and Paul by noting their apocalypticism, temporal dualism, and cosmological dualism. How does he identify their cosmological dualism? By examining their lexicography. When he sees Jesus referring to Satan and demons, and Jesus performing exorcisms, he concludes Jesus held typical beliefs in supernatural evil beings, and that he therefore held to a cosmological dualism. When he sees Paul referring to Satan, he concludes Paul held typical Second Temple beliefs about Satan as a supernatural evil being, and that he therefore held to a cosmological dualism. All of this seems entirely reasonable. After all, we know that in the Second Temple period, beliefs in supernatural evil were common, beliefs in specific supernatural evil beings such as fallen angels and demons were also common, and terms such as Satan were used, at least in some texts, to refer to such beings. After reviewing Ben's case, I then reviewed terms used for evil figures in Second Temple period Judaism, as well as the terms in the New Testament, which have traditionally been understood as referring to a single supernatural evil personal being, typically a fallen angel or demon. The image on screen now summarizes my findings. I'll describe the image contents for the benefit of anyone listening to this video, but not watching it. Briefly, in Second Temple period literature, the term Satan, whether in Hebrew or Greek, is predominantly used as a common noun rather than as a personal name. The term the devil in Greek is rarely, if ever, used to refer to a supernatural evil being. And the terms the tempter and the evil one in Greek have no pre-Christian witness with a reference to a supernatural evil being. This chart demonstrates that when a Second Temple period text uses a term such as Satan, or the devil, or even the evil one, they may not be referring to a supernatural evil being, such as a fallen angel or evil spirit. They may be referring to a human, or to an obedient angel of God acting as an adversary to humans, or even referring to evil in the abstract. In my last video, I also reviewed the evidence for a Second Temple period countercurrent of beliefs about evil which directly opposed the cosmological dualist view of a world in which evil and sin originated from supernatural evil beings. I demonstrated that although beliefs in supernatural evil were common among Jews of the Second Temple period, many Jews rejected such beliefs and attributed the origin of evil and sin to human beings instead. Let's return to that flowchart we looked at previously to see why I concluded that this lexicographical evidence gives us reason to reconsider Ben's conclusion. On screen now, you can see the original flowchart. However, you'll notice I've changed it a little. 
I've explained that whereas Ben assumed that the Greek terms he examined, which are commonly translated in English as referring to a supernatural evil being called Satan, they didn't necessarily have that meaning in Second Temple period Judaism. For the benefit of anyone listening to this video but not watching it, I'll read the quotations I've added from scholars Antti Lato and Guy Williams. Lato says, quote, Furthermore, even when Satan is mentioned, it is commonly as a type of angel, occurring frequently in the plural, the Satans. Thus, we lack an established tradition whereby the name of the personal evil, or the leader of demons, is Satan. End quote. Guy Williams writes, quote, There was, then, no standard nomenclature for this figure. We find no edifice which we may call the Jewish doctrine of Satan. End quote. Now I'll add to those quotations a few more. Antilato also says, quote, It should be observed that Satan was not the self-evident name of the leader of demons in early Jewish writings. End quote. Joseph Kelly notes, quote, First Enoch does refer to Satan, chapter 53, verse 3, not as an evil being, but as one carrying out the commands of God to punish evildoers, the traditional biblical view of Satan as adversary. End quote. Philip Armand writes, quote, In the book of Jubilees, Satan was not so much a proper name as a description of Mastema's role on behalf of God as the accuser or the adversary. End quote. Similarly, Dr. Wesley Carr, after an extensive analysis of pre-Christian Second Temple period pagan and Jewish texts, concluded that, quote, the concept of mighty forces that are hostile to man, from which he sought relief, was not prevalent in the thought world of the first century AD, end quote. Significantly, he added, quote, such a conclusion requires that we re-examine the particularly Pauline evidence on this subject by exegesis of the relevant texts, end quote. This is, of course, the same kind of argument I am making, that the lexicographical evidence should compel a reconsideration of long-held assumptions about New Testament Satanology and demonology. We have clear evidence from the socio-historical context, then, that when we read these words in the New Testament, we can't simply assume they refer to supernatural evil beings. They may be referring to a human, or to an obedient angel of God acting as an adversary to humans, or even referring to evil in the abstract. All of these meanings are attested in the proximate Second Temple period literature. For the sake of consistency, I've called this forensic lexicography. Alternatively, these words may be referring to supernatural evil beings. Again, for the sake of consistency, I've called this cosmological lexicography. So now, we should be able to see that we need to go back one step in the process. How do we determine the meaning of these words? How do we decide if they're forensic lexicography or cosmological lexicography? On screen now is a third flowchart. This one illustrates my own research methodology, and you'll see how it's different to Ben's in a significant way. Let's start at the far right-hand side, as we did before. Unlike Ben, I conclude that Jesus and Paul held a forensic apocalyptic worldview. Now let's move further to the left and see how I reached this conclusion. As I do, we immediately see the first significant difference. You can see that I believe the relevant New Testament lexicography is forensic, not cosmological. So, I believe the references to Satan and demons don't indicate reference to supernatural evil beings in whose existence the writers believed. On what basis do I interpret the lexicography in this way? Let's move further to the left and find out. Now you can see that I previously concluded that Jesus and Paul held to a forensic dualism rather than a cosmological dualism. Consequently, I interpreted their lexicography in that context. If their dualism was forensic, then it makes sense to regard their lexicography as forensic. Let's swap out the image of my approach with the image of Ben's so we can see the difference clearly. First, here's Ben's methodology. 
see how he interprets lexicography first and then uses that information to interpret which form of dualism the writers held. Now let's look at my approach again. See how in my methodology I've done the reverse. I'm using the writer's form of dualism to interpret their lexicography. So let's go back further to the left in my flowchart to find out how I've interpreted their dualism. Now we see something in my approach which wasn't in Ben's. We both agree Jesus and Paul have an apocalyptic eschatology, and we reached that conclusion using the same method, so that's not the difference. You can see I've used something to interpret their dualism, which Ben didn't. On my chart, it's called hamartiology, which is the study of theological explanations for sin. You can see I've placed a question mark next to it because the chart doesn't explain how I reached my conclusions or what the options are. So, what have I actually done here? Why does my methodology differ so significantly from Ben's? Why have I chosen to interpret Jesus and Paul's lexicography with an understanding of their dualism? And why have I chosen to interpret their dualism with this other thing, hamartiology, first? It might seem like my approach is clearly motivated by an attempt to reframe the evidence to my advantage. What other reason could I have for deciding that even though words like Satan and the devil are used by Jesus and Paul, and even though both Jesus and Paul refer to demons, and even though the Gospels do refer to exorcisms, Jesus and Paul themselves don't hold to a cosmological dualism. Surely the meaning of those words is pretty clear, and they should determine our understanding of the writer's dualism, not the other way around. I realise this might seem like I'm cheating, so I'll need to take some time to explain why I'm taking this approach. You may remember that as a result of my diaconic and synchronic lexical analysis presented in the previous video and presented again briefly here, I discovered that those Greek words which initially seemed so transparently clear, with apparently very obvious meanings, didn't actually have exactly the meanings which are so frequently attributed to them. We saw that in the Second Temple period, just because a writer refers to Satan or the devil, it doesn't mean they necessarily have a supernatural evil being in mind. Although that language was used by writers who believed in supernatural evil, it was also used by writers who rejected belief in supernatural evil. Although it might seem obvious that words such as Satan and the devil refer to a fallen angel or evil spirit, we found they were also used of evil humans or enemy nations, or even just used as generic references to evil in general. So in this case, a writer's lexicography alone cannot settle the issue of what their lexicography itself means. We must interpret their lexicography in a broader context. In fact, this is not only the case with vocabulary related to Satan and demons, it's the standard method of interpreting the meaning of any ancient text. Word meanings are defined by context. On screen now is an image illustrating this process, which is called pragmatics, the means by which the meaning of a text is established. You can find various images like this online, some of which are far more complex, as they describe various tools used in either lexicography or semantics, such as reader response theory and discourse analysis. My image is a simplified presentation of the process in order to demonstrate the relationship between socio-cultural context, lexicography, and semantics, the actual meaning of the text. To begin the process, we start with the socio-cultural context. This establishes the conceptual range of the text, giving us a general understanding of the concepts to which the text may refer. This allows us to rule out many possible meanings while restricting ourselves to those which are more likely. For example, a first century text isn't going to refer to astronauts and television. These ideas just simply don't exist within the text's conceptual world. They aren't part of the text's socio-cultural context. Having established socio-cultural context, we then move on to lexicographical analysis. Now we're looking at the writer's individual words, and once again, we need to establish the range of possible meanings they could have. This is the point at which we perform the diachronic and synchronic analysis I provided previously. Once we have determined the range of possible meanings the writer's words could have, 
we move on to looking at which of those meanings the writer is most likely to have used. This is the lexical meaning. This is where contextual analysis comes into play, and we can now see why I placed our analysis of dualism at this point. Because once we've established the range of possible meanings a writer's lexicography could have, then we need additional information to inform us which of those possible meanings is most likely. Analyzing a writer's dualism will help us do that, because a writer holding to cosmological dualism will most likely be referring to a supernatural evil being when using words like Satan and the devil, whereas a writer holding a forensic dualism will most likely be referring to a non-supernatural being or a supernatural being which is an obedient servant of God. Finally, after we have identified what the individual words most likely mean, we can use semantic analysis to determine the intended meaning the writer embedded in the text. It's at this point we use a range of other tools, such as discourse analysis, rhetorical analysis, and reader response theory. Now, as I mentioned in the previous video, we can't just point arbitrarily to individual Jews or even Jewish groups during this period and say, well, they believed X, so Paul and Jesus must have believed X as well. We need to identify which individuals and groups Paul and Jesus were geographically, chronologically, and theologically proximate to, and use some kind of methodology to identify significant similarities and differences between Jesus and Paul's views and the views of those to whom they were proximate or closest. So, even though I've demonstrated that words such as Satan and the devil didn't necessarily refer to a supernatural evil being, and even though I've demonstrated that some Jews during the Second Temple period rejected supernatural evil, I can't simply arbitrarily attribute these positions to Jesus and Paul. I need some kind of methodology in order to determine what their views are. In this case, as you can see, the methodology I've used is to first identify which form of dualism Jesus and Paul held, and then used that to interpret their lexicography. As part of that process, I've examined their hamartiology. This is a critical component in the identification of cosmological dualism, since the entire purpose of supernatural evil beings, such as Satan, fallen angels, demons, and evil spirits, is to provide an explanation of evil and sin. Let's now look at how I went about examining the dualism of Jesus and Paul. Second Temple Period Dualism Before we can decide which form of dualism Jesus and Paul held, we need to establish the characteristics of the two primary forms of dualism within Second Temple Period Judaism. These two forms were cosmological dualism and forensic dualism. We will find that in both cases, a significant differentiating factor is their hamartiology, how each system of dualism explains the origin and continued presence of sin in the world. We will start by looking at cosmological dualism. Firstly, in cosmological dualism, evil and sin had a supernatural origin in the actions of supernatural evil beings. Dr. Miriam Brand, who specializes in Second Temple Period literature, explains that these beings were typically identified by name as the Watchers, whose existence was inferred from Genesis chapter 6. Secondly, cosmological dualism also attributes contemporary sin to supernatural beings. Brand notes that in cosmological dualism, quote, the idea that demons cause sin relied on traditions regarding specific demonic characters, end quote. She also explains that cosmological dualism texts attribute sin to Israel being ruled over by an angelic adversary such as Belia or by a foreign nation. Thirdly, cosmological dualism features two main ways of combating these supernatural influences. One is apotropaic prayer, that is, prayer to God specifically to be delivered from supernatural evil in the form of angelic adversaries, demons, or spirits. Brand writes, quote, the prayers that reflect a belief in demonic influence decry the pernicious manipulation executed by the Watcher's descendants, among other demonic forces. End quote. The other method of battling these supernatural influences is the reading and observance of the Law of Moses. Brand provides the example of the Damascus document, one of the Qumran texts, 
in which, quote, the author declares that as soon as one returns to the Torah of Moses, the angel of hostility, or Mastema, will leave him, end quote. So, in cosmic dualism, we find a cosmic hamartiology. Supernatural evil beings are the cause of the origin and continued presence of sin in the world. Consequently, human sin results from possession or influence by these supernatural evil beings, and supernatural intervention by God or supernatural acts of power such as exorcism are necessary in order to combat evil and sin in human beings. Now let's examine forensic dualism. Firstly, forensic dualism attributes the origin of evil and sin to human beings, typically to Adam and Eve's sin in the Garden of Eden. Professor Joseph Fitzmaier wrote that the narrative of Genesis 2-3 was an etiology of sin which, quote, sought to explain how this sinful condition of humanity first emerged, end quote, as it, quote, tells how Adam and Eve brought sin into the world, end quote. The aim was to teach that the origin of evil and sin is, quote, not in God, but from human beings, end quote. We have already seen how forensic dualism Second Temple period texts such as the Maccabees, Wisdom of Sirach, the Apocalypse of Baruch, and the Apocalypse of Ezra made use of this etiology. Bamberger notes, quote, In their effort to solve the problem of evil, these writings make no use of dualistic myths concerning fallen angels, evil spirits, or devils. End quote. Secondly, forensic dualism attributes contemporary sin mainly to the Yetzer Ra, a Hebrew term commonly translated evil inclination or evil impulse, and referring to an internal natural human tendency or impulse to sin. Forensic dualism also recognizes that humans may tempt other humans to sin. In fact, it even recognizes that God may place an individual in a testing situation or a trial in which they may sin, which may be orchestrated by obedient angels, bringing about the test at God's command. Such situations are differentiated from the supernatural evil temptations of cosmological dualism in several ways. 1. Unlike evil angels or demons, God is not attempting to cause the individual to sin, but to test their moral resolve. 2. Unlike evil angels or demons, God does not deceive the individual into sinning. They remain fully aware of the two choices before them and the moral distinction between the two options. They are not tricked into an evil choice which is made to appear good. 3. Unlike evil angels or demons, God does not supernaturally compel the individual to sin. Their free will remains unimpeded. In contrast, Evil angels or demons overcome or possess the individual in order to cause them to sin, even against their will. Thirdly, forensic dualism features three main ways of avoiding sin. One is personal self-discipline. Brand provides an example from the Apocalypse of Ezra, in which the prophet Ezra instructs the people to avoid sin, saying, quote, If you, then, will rule over your minds and discipline your hearts, you shall be kept alive, and after death, you shall obtain mercy. End quote. The emphasis here is on the individual's free will and on their personal responsibility for disciplining their own impulses. The second way of avoiding sin in forensic dualism is supplicatory prayer to God for strength, guidance, and deliverance. Brand explains that this may reflect the view that, quote, humans are unable to extricate themselves from this condition without divine assistance, end quote. And consequently in these prayers, quote, supplicants turn to God in prayer, expressing their helplessness and God's goodness, end quote. However, whereas the apotropaic prayers of cosmological dualism refer explicitly to supernatural evil beings, even calling them by name, the supplicatory prayers of forensic dualism cite only the need for assistance with self-discipline and ask for assistance overcoming the natural impulse to sin. As an example, Brand cites a passage from Ben Sirah in which he, quote, explicitly asks God for help in setting whips upon his thought and discipline upon his heart in order to prevent future sins, end quote. The third way of avoiding sin in forensic dualism 
is the reading and observance of the law of Moses. Brand quotes Ben Sira's words, quote, He who keeps the law gains mastery over the object of his thought or inclination, end quote. And Brand adds, quote, While God has implanted passions in humans, their mind and the law have been given to them in order to control these passions, end quote. So, in forensic dualism, we find a forensic or anthropogenic hamartiology. Human beings are the cause of the origin and continued presence of sin in the world. Consequently, human sin results from failure to restrain or resist the innate evil inclination or natural human impulse to sin. And evil and sin by human beings is overcome not through supernatural acts of power such as exorcism, or asking God to combat a supernatural foe such as a demon, but through personal self-discipline and praying to God for strength to restrain internal desires, as well as studying his commandments in the law. New Testament Hamartiology Now let's see if we can identify New Testament dualism. In support of his view that Jesus and Paul held to a cosmological dualism, Ben pointed to references to demons and exorcism in the Gospels and the Book of Acts, as well as references to Satan in Paul's letters. I'll examine all those references in detail in my next video, but for now I want to look at broad trends of dualism in the New Testament. In particular, I'll be looking at whether Jesus and Paul's view of the causes of evil and sin are attributed to humans, as is the case with forensic dualism, or to supernatural evil beings as is the case with cosmological dualism. Let's start by looking at Jesus' hamartiology. First, to what does Jesus attribute the origin of sin? Despite what we might expect, Jesus never mentions the narrative in Genesis 3 in the Old Testament, which describes how the woman Eve was tempted by a serpent to break God's commandment, and the man Adam then followed her example. However, in John 8.44, Jesus does seem to allude to some of the events in Genesis 4. He says, quote, You people are from your father the devil, and you want to do what your father desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, and does not uphold the truth, because there is no truth in him. Whenever he lies, he speaks according to his own nature, because he is a liar and the father of lies. End quote. Now, strictly speaking, I should leave this verse aside for now since it uses the Greek word diabolos, which literally means false accuser or enemy, but which is commonly translated the devil. So, it's one of the words in dispute in my discussion with Ben, and technically I should leave it until after I've already established the form of dualism Jesus held. However, without actually drawing a conclusion on this word just yet, I do want to provide some context for its possible meaning. Although it might look like a straightforward reference to a supernatural evil being who caused Adam and Eve to sin, there are other considerations to take into account. Firstly, it doesn't reference any of the events in Genesis 3. In particular, it doesn't identify the devil with the serpent which tempted Eve. Secondly, it doesn't describe this devil as tempting anyone. Thirdly, it describes the devil as a murderer. This is significant because the serpent who tempted Eve in Genesis 3 didn't murder anyone, and the first murder which is recorded in the book of Genesis doesn't appear until chapter 4, when Cain, one of Adam and Eve's sons, murders his brother Abel. In fact, nowhere in Second Temple period literature does any text identify the serpent in Eden as the devil, or say it was Satan or the devil who tempted Eve, rather than the serpent. The earliest text which does attribute the temptation of Eve to the devil is the pseudepigraphal work Life of Adam and Eve, in which the devil is said to speak through the mouth of the serpent in order to tempt Eve. However, even then, this text doesn't even use the word for devil. It uses the word Satan. Even if we consider this an insignificant difference, a further problem is that this text does not describe Satan as a murderer. Yet another difficulty is that this text postdates the Synoptic Gospels considerably. 
Scholarship typically dates it to the end of the first century, decades after Matthew, Mark, and Luke were written. Consequently, we cannot use the life of Adam and Eve as a text with which to interpret Jesus' words. It's just far too late. However, there is an earlier text we can use which shows far greater similarity with Jesus' reference to a murderer at the beginning of the world. That text is Wisdom of Solomon. A possible date range for this book is mid-1st century BCE to the end of the 1st century, but it is often dated to the early 1st century. Even a date in the 1st century BCE would still mean this book was written very close to the time when Jesus lived. So it's a text which is much more likely to represent an interpretation of Genesis 3 and 4 that Jesus would actually have held. In Wisdom of Solomon 2.24, we find the statement, quote, But through the devil's envy, death entered the world, and those who belong to his party experience it, end quote. This is much closer to Jesus' words than the quotation from Life of Adam and Eve. Not only does it use the Greek word diablos, commonly translated the devil, the same word Jesus uses in John 8.44, but it directly attributes the first death to the devil. Now, we have already seen Wisdom of Solomon in our Second Temple Period diachronic and synchronic lexicographical analysis. There are no references in this text to demons or evil spirits, and it doesn't use any of the standard names of supernatural adversaries, such as Asahel, Mastema, or Belial. Nor does it use any of the other terms we've examined, such as Satan, the Evil One, or the Tempter. Dr. Jason Zorowski, lecturer in Second Temple Judaism and Early Christian Studies, notes the complete absence of any beliefs in supernatural evil in Wisdom of Solomon, writing, quote, The devil has no place in this author's thought, end quote. So, when the author of Wisdom of Solomon refers to the devil, he isn't referring to a supernatural evil being. So, what is he referring to? I mentioned previously that the first recorded death in Genesis doesn't take place until chapter 4, when Adam and Eve's second son Cain murders his brother Abel. Biblical scholar Professor Philip Davies observed that the devil in this passage, quote, has been taken by many interpreters to refer to Cain, end quote. Consequently, the most natural interpretation of Jesus' reference to the devil as a murderer from the beginning is that he held the same view as the author of Wisdom of Solomon, and that he is referring to Cain, the human son of Adam and Eve, as causing the entry of murder into the world. I'll return to this passage in the next video, but for now, it's sufficient to point out that there is no clear allusion in John 8.44 to a supernatural evil being, and there are good socio-cultural grounds for understanding it as a reference to Cain. Now let's move on and see what Jesus says about the cause of contemporary sin. First, we find Jesus attributes this consistently to natural human impulses. In Matthew 5, 28-30, and Mark 9, 43-47, he warns of the danger of your hand, foot, or eye causing you to sin. In Matthew 5, 19, he says, quote, for out of the heart come evil ideas, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. End quote. He says the same in Mark 7, 21-23. Quote, For from within, out of the human heart, come evil ideas, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, evil, deceit, debauchery, envy, slander, pride, and folly. All these evils come from within and defile a person. End quote. Likewise, in Luke 6.45, he says, quote, The good person out of the good treasury of his heart produces good, and the evil person out of his evil treasury produces evil, for his mouth speaks from what fills his heart. End quote. Secondly, Jesus identifies human beings as a temptation to sin. On an occasion recorded in Matthew 16.23 and Mark 8.33, he says, quote, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block. End quote. But he's actually addressing his disciple Peter, who was suggesting Jesus avoid going to Jerusalem, where he knew he would be killed. The Greek word for stumbling block here means a temptation to sin, 
and it is significant that throughout the New Testament it is only ever used to refer to humans as a source of temptation to sin. In Matthew 18.7, Luke 17.1, Romans 14.13 and 16.17 and Revelation 2.14. Additionally, it is remarkable that Jesus explicitly calls Peter Satan, using this term to refer to a very human tempter rather than to a supernatural evil being. This is not an isolated incident. On another occasion, recorded in John 6 verse 70, Jesus speaks to his disciples saying, quote, One of you is the devil, end quote, referring to his disciple Judas. We will come back to these two events in the next video, but for now it's important to note that whatever Jesus thought of supernatural evil, in his view the terms Satan and the devil could naturally refer to human adversaries. You may wonder why I haven't yet mentioned demons and evil spirits. The simple reason for this is that Jesus never identifies them as a cause of contemporary sin. There is one occasion on which Jesus refers to a person having unclean spirits in them, recorded in Matthew 12, 43-45 and Luke 11, 21-26, but even then he doesn't identify them as a cause of sin, nor even temptation to sin. However, I will get back to this passage later. In the last section of this video, I'll have more to say about exorcism in the New Testament, but it won't be until the last video that I deal with what Jesus said about those unclean spirits and with accounts of Jesus' exorcisms. Now let's look at how Jesus believed sin was to be overcome. Does he ever have recourse to the supernatural remedies of cosmological dualism? Before I proceed, please note that, as with the previous section, I am omitting all the references to Jesus' exorcisms for the simple reason that none of the Gospels ever identifies exorcism as a remedy for sin. Again, I will provide a detailed examination of the New Testament accounts of exorcism in the last video in this series. So what does Jesus describe as the correct remedy for sin? Most frequently, he says that sin is to be avoided through mental self-discipline. We find this expressed particularly vividly in Matthew 5, 28-30 and Mark 9, 43-47 where Jesus uses the imagery of cutting off your hand or foot or plucking out your eye if they cause you to sin. These are metaphors for self-discipline. Significantly, one of Jesus' sayings in these passages has a strong parallel with an earlier Second Temple period passage. In Matthew 5, 28-29, Jesus says, quote, But I say to you that whoever looks at the woman to desire her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better to lose one of your members than to have your whole body thrown into hell. End quote. This is quite similar to Wisdom of Sirach 9.8, which says, quote, Turn away your eyes from a shapely woman, and do not look intently at beauty belonging to another. Many have been misled by a woman's beauty, and by it a passion is kindled like a fire. End quote. In both these cases, the cause of temptation is the human heart, prompted by an attractive woman, and the remedy is self-discipline. It is noteworthy that Jesus' words again have a strong parallel with an earlier Second Temple period text which rejected supernatural evil. In passing, it is also worth noting that Jesus exclusively blames men for the lust they feel towards women. He does not blame the women. Likewise, Jesus identifies the remedy as men exercising control over themselves. He does not place any responsibility on the woman to reduce their probability of being lusted after by men. Another remedy for sin identified by Jesus is the knowledge of the law. In two of the Gospel accounts of Jesus' temptation in the wilderness, Matthew 4, 1-11 and Luke 4, 1-13, Jesus confronts his three temptations with the words, quote, It is written, end quote, citing Moses' words in Deuteronomy 6, 13 and 16, and Deuteronomy 8, 3. Although, strictly speaking, Deuteronomy contains Moses' commentary on the law rather than the law itself, the book quotes the law extensively, and by the Second Temple period, Deuteronomy itself had become known as one of the five books of the law, or the Torah. 
A third remedy for sin identified by Jesus is supplicatory prayer. In Matthew 6.13 and Luke 11.4, when Jesus is teaching his disciples to pray, he instructs them to request of God, quote, do not lead us into temptation, deliver us from evil, end quote. Also translated, deliver us from the evil one. There are two points to note about this important part of the Lord's Prayer. Firstly, Jesus guides his disciples to request God not to lead them into temptation. Clearly, there is no hint here that temptation originates with a supernatural evil being. Secondly, it must be understood there is dispute over whether the final phrase should be translated deliver us from evil or deliver us from the evil one. The United Bible Society's guidebook for translators notes, quote, New Testament scholars are divided on their judgment, end quote. It explains that some scholars prefer the generic translation deliver us from evil on the basis that, quote, neither Hebrew nor Aramaic uses the evil one, to denote Satan, end quote. You may remember that this is a fact I identified previously in my diachronic and synchronic lexicographical analysis of Second Temple period use of the term the evil one. However, the guidebook also notes that other scholars, quote, believe the phrase may refer to the evil one, that is, the devil, end quote. We'll return to this particular verse in the next video in this series, but for now, it's important to note that I have already established that no Second Temple period text uses this Greek term to refer to a supernatural evil being. None of the seven passages in the New Testament using this term identify it as a source of temptation, and that the rabbinic era texts use it to refer to the evil inclination, the natural impulse within humans, which causes them to sin. Now we're in a position to compare the homartiology of Jesus to the homartiology of cosmological dualism and forensic dualism. Let's see what we find. When he explains the origin of evil and sin, he makes no mention of Adam, Eve, or the serpent in Genesis 3. However, he does appear to refer to Cain, called, quote, your father the devil, end quote, John 8, 44. When he refers to the contemporary cause of sin, Jesus refers to people's own actions, your hand, foot, or eye, Matthew 5, 28 to 30, Mark 9, 43 to 47, or to within a person, out of the human heart, Matthew 15, 19, Mark 7, 21 to 23, and Luke 6, 45, or to human adversaries, saying, quote, get behind me, Satan, you are a stumbling block, end quote, speaking to his disciple Peter, or, quote, one of you is the devil, end quote speaking of his disciple Judas in Matthew 16:23, Mark 8:33 and John 6:70. When Jesus speaks of remedies for sin, he has three solutions. One solution is personal discipline, using language such as cut off your hand or foot or pluck out your eye in Matthew 5:28-30 and Mark 9:43-47. Another solution is the law of Moses. So Jesus says, Quote, it is written, end quote, in Matthew 4, verses 4, 6, and 10, and Luke 4, verses 4, 8, and 12, citing Deuteronomy 6, verses 13 and 16, and Deuteronomy 8, 3. Jesus' third solution is supplicatory prayer. So he advises his disciples to pray to God with words like, quote, do not lead us into temptation, deliver us from evil, end quote, in Matthew 6, 13, and Luke 11, 4. Now let's compare that to the homartiology of cosmological dualism. Firstly, there is a supernatural origin of evil and sin, typically the watchers. Secondly, sin results from deceit or possession by supernatural evil, typically demons, or other evil beings such as Belial or Mastema. Thirdly, supernatural evil is fought with exorcism, atropaic prayer, and law observance. Clearly, Jesus' homartiology is not a good fit for cosmological dualism. Now let's compare Jesus' views with the homartiology of forensic dualism. Firstly, forensic dualism posits a human origin of evil and sin, typically Adam and Eve. Secondly, in forensic dualism, sin results from the Yetzirah, a natural human impulse, or from temptation by humans, or from failure in a divinely arranged trial. 
Thirdly, in forensic dualism, sin is avoided through mental self-discipline, supplicatory prayer, and law observance. That's quite clearly a much better match. From this, I conclude Jesus held to a forensic hamartiology and therefore a forensic dualism. Now let's move on to examine Paul's hamartiology in the same way. Before I do, please note that I will be addressing the text typically attributed to Paul by the current mainstream scholarly consensus. The recognized Pauline corpus consists of just seven books Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Philippians, 1st Thessalonians, and Philemon. If you want to understand why only seven of the books traditionally attributed to Paul are recognized as authentic by modern scholars, I encourage you to read an excellent article on Ben's blog explaining this in some detail. See the video description for a link. So let's look at Paul's homartiology. Paul attributes the origin of sin directly to Adam. In Romans 5.12, he says, quote, Sin entered the world through one man, end quote. In 1 Corinthians 15.21, he says, quote, Death came through a man, end quote, whom he identifies in verse 22 as Adam. In 2 Corinthians 11.3, he mentions Eve being deceived by the serpent, but he does not attribute the origin of sin to Eve. He only holds Adam responsible. So we can conclude that he thought the serpent's deception of Eve was instrumental in the sin of Adam, but he nevertheless holds Adam responsible for his own actions and never attributes the entry of sin to Eve. It is significant that he mentions Adam's sin and the serpent's deception of Eve, but never mention Eve's sin of breaking God's commandment and eating the forbidden fruit. His omission of any reference to Eve's transgression is clearly deliberate. It appears he holds Adam more culpable because Eve was deceived into committing sin, but Adam sinned knowingly and with full intention. This is a sharp contrast with the second temple period text, Wisdom of Sirach, which blames Eve for the entry of sin into the world, writing, quote, From a woman sin had its beginning, and because of her we all die, end quote. Scholars have noted that Paul's attribution of the origin of sin and death to Adam not only aligns him with forensic dualism, but also places him at distance from cosmological dualism. Dr. Egal German notes that Paul thus differentiates himself from other Second Temple period and early Christian writers in which, quote, Satan is seen as the external source of death, end quote. Likewise, Professor Torsten Lofsted observes that although, quote, one place where we might expect Paul to refer to Satan is in connection with the fall of man, end quote. In fact, quote, unlike later theologians, he does not use this as a proof text documenting Satan's involvement in causing sin, end quote. Professor Susan Garrett says that although Paul alludes to the temptation of Adam and Eve in Eden, quote, it is the twin powers of sin and death, not Satan, who accost Adam and so enter into the cosmic drama, end quote. She adds that, quote, sin and death here are like Satan, but without the personality. They do the same thing Satan routinely does, namely lead God's children astray and inflict destruction and decay, end quote. Professor Paul Losaki similarly observes that although the Edenic narrative of temptation and sin plays a similar part in Paul's somatiology as it does in cosmological second period texts, it lacks, quote, the angelic sin that has corrupted nature, end quote. Instead, Saki notes, the sin of cosmological beings, quote, is replaced by an equivalent, the sin of Adam, end quote. This is particularly significant since it means that in the socio-cultural context of either a cosmological or a forensic origin for sin and death, Paul deliberately chose the forensic origin, blaming Adam, and excluded any suggestion of supernatural evil beings being responsible. Consequently, Egal German writes that the forensic hamartiology of 4 Ezra and 2 Baruch, both of which reject belief in supernatural evil, quote, resembles the Pauline portrait of Adam, end quote. When it comes to contemporary sin, Paul frequently attributes this to the natural inclinations of the human heart using language such as desires of their hearts, sinful desires, law of sin that is in my members, live by the flesh, in the flesh, 
and the flesh has desires. In Romans 1, 24, 7 verses 5, 17 and 23, 8 verses 5 and 9, and Galatians 5, 17. Professor Emma Wasserman, quoted by Ben in his original article, notes the similarities between Paul and various pre-Christian and Second Temple period Greek and Jewish authors, writing, quote, Like these writers, Paul uses sin to stand for the irrational passions and appetites that operate as an evil counter-ruler within the soul, end quote. She notes that Paul's description is very like the Greek Platonists who held, quote, a very distinctive idea of the soul as locked in an ongoing struggle that determines behavior, end quote. Regardless of whether she thinks Paul believed in a supernatural evil satanic figure, Wasserman's article makes no reference to Satan or the devil and does not represent Paul as holding a cosmological dualism. Instead, she writes that in the same way that Platonists describe an internal struggle between, quote, rational and irrational parts of the soul, end quote, Paul himself, quote, depicts a war between God and sin in Romans 6, sin and the mind in Romans 7, and flesh and spirit in Romans 8, 1 to 13, end quote. Dr. Daniel Schumann notes that Paul's usage of the term sin, quote, can be traced back to Sirach 21, 2, 27, 10, and 1 QHA 12, 30 to 31, a Qumran text, end quote. Again, we see Paul's homartiology aligning with the wisdom of Sirach, a work which rejected belief in supernatural evil. Paul's complete avoidance of any reference to Satan or demons in his description of the process of temptation and sin in his letter to the Romans has been remarked on by many scholars. Professor James Dunn, who was particularly well known for his work on Paul's letters, wrote that, quote, it is noticeable that even in this antithesis, Paul prefers to speak of the power opposed to God as sin rather than Satan, end quote. Lofsted similarly observes that although, quote, Paul writes extensively about sin and human nature, end quote, in Romans, quote, curiously, he does not explicitly bring Satan into the equation at all, end quote. Lofsted's conclusion on this point is worth quoting in full. He says, quote, if Paul had a worldview characterized by cosmological dualism, where God is engaged in a battle with his evil counterpart for human souls, we would expect him to emphasize the role Satan has in causing people to sin. This is what he does not do in Romans. What Paul does in Romans is write about sin. End quote. This is a fact for which forensic dualism has considerable explanatory power. In contrast, a heavy burden of evidence lies on anyone attempting to argue that belief in supernatural evil beings is a more efficient explanation for Paul's views as expressed in Romans. Paul also attributes contemporary sin to human adversaries, whether enemies of Christians or Christians causing each other to sin, using language such as place an obstacle or a trap before a brother or sister, cause anyone to stumble, anything that causes your brother to stumble, and cause one of them to sin, in Romans 14, verses 13, 20 to 21, and 1 Corinthians 8, 13. However, although attributing sin to external human adversaries, he never attributes it to external supernatural evil beings, such as demons and evil spirits. Just like his descriptions of the origin of sin and the cause of contemporary sin, Paul's remedies for dealing with temptation and avoiding sin align very strongly with forensic dualism. Frequently, Paul urges self-discipline as a means of overcoming temptation and sin, writing, Do not let sin reign. Put to death the deeds of the body. Walk by the Spirit. Abstain from every form of evil. Crucify the flesh with its passions and desires. Make no provision for the flesh to arouse its desires. In Romans 6, verses 6, 12 to 14, 8, verses 4 and 13, 12, 2, 13, 14, Galatians 5, verses 16 to 18 and 24, and 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 3 to 5 and 5, 22. Since he knows humans can also cause others to sin, and even Christians can cause their brothers and sisters in Christ to sin, 
he likewise urges Christians not to place an obstacle or a trap before a brother or sister, not to cause anyone to stumble, not to do anything that causes your brother to stumble, and not to cause one of them to sin in Romans 14 verses 13, 20 to 21, and 1 Corinthians 8, 13. Additionally, he says that strong Christians, when they find a weaker Christian has been overcome by a sin, should support them. Carry one another's burdens, he says, in Galatians 6, verses 1 to 2, taking care lest they also are tempted and fall into sin. Although Paul also identifies divine assistance as a means of overcoming temptation and sin, it is never in the form of a power encounter such as an exorcism. Instead, in Romans 7, 24-25, Paul says that God will, quote, rescue me from this body of death, end quote, through Christ, so that he will, quote, serve the law of God, end quote. More specifically, in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, he assures his readers that when they are tempted, quote, God will provide a way out so that you may be able to endure it, end quote. We have already seen that both cosmological hamartiology and forensic hamartiology cite the law of Moses as a means of overcoming temptation and sin. This being the case, it is striking that Paul completely avoids any suggestion that study and observance of the law is a remedy for sin. The primary purpose for this is that, for Paul, the law's purpose has already been fulfilled through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. This is why Paul is insistent throughout his letters that the law, though worthy and useful for its purpose, has no hold on the Christian. Although this makes Paul's hamartiology less similar to forensic hamartiology, it also places him even further from the cosmological dualism of cosmological hamartiology. However, when Paul does reference the law, he sometimes does so in ways which indicate he rejected certain typical beliefs of cosmological hamartiology. Dr. Miriam Brand explains that in various Second Temple period texts, Gentile nations are identified as allied with and ruled by Belial and evil spirits. She notes that in the Book of Jubilees, the Gentile nations, quote, are themselves ruled by sin-causing spirits, end quote, and that in the Qumran war scroll, quote, Belial's army is first described as consisting not of spirits, but of the nations, end quote. However, it is clear that Paul does not hold this cosmological dualist view of Gentile nations. In fact, Completely to the contrary, in Romans 2, 14-15, Paul asserts that even though the Gentiles do not have the law, they may still, quote, do by nature the things required by the law, end quote, and thus show that, quote, the work of the law is written in their hearts, end quote. Scholars debate whether the law here refers specifically to the law of Moses or to a kind of basic innate sense of right and wrong which God has placed in every human heart, but there is overwhelming agreement that in Paul's view, all people, including Gentiles, have been divinely gifted with some sense of law, giving everyone a basic conscience differentiating right from wrong. This is a remarkable departure from the view of the nations found in cosmological dualism. Another feature of Paul's discussion of battling temptation and sin is his complete lack of of any reference to apotropaic prayer. This was a standard feature of cosmological dualism and a typical method of opposing supernatural evil beings such as Satan figures and demons. If Paul really believed in such beings, then some explanation must be provided as to why he never mentions this typical response. Its absence from his writings, and in particular from his discussion of temptation and sin, aligns him very well with the homartiology of forensic dualism and differentiates him from cosmological dualism. Now we're in a position to compare the homartiology of Paul to the homartiology of cosmological dualism and forensic dualism. Let's see what we find. In Paul's homartiology, the origin of evil and sin is Adam's sin in Eden, Romans 5.12, 1 Corinthians 15, 
21 to 22. He also cites the serpent's deception of Eve in 2 Corinthians 11.3 as a possible contributing factor to Adam's sin. In Paul's homarchaeology, there are two main contemporary causes of sin. One is within, out of the human heart, which he describes with phrases such as desires of their hearts, sinful desires, law of sin that is in my members, live by the flesh, in the flesh, the flesh has desires. In Romans 1, 24, 7, verses 5, 17, and 23, 8, 5, 8, verses 5, and 9, and Galatians 5, 17. Another is human adversaries, even other Christians, which he describes with phrases such as place an obstacle or a trap before a brother or sister, cause anyone to stumble, anything that causes your brother to stumble, cause one of them to sin. In Romans 14, verses 13, 20 to 21, and 1 Corinthians 8, 13. In Paul's homartiology, there are three remedies for sin. One is self-discipline, which he describes with terms such as do not let sin reign, put to death the deeds of the body, walk by the spirit, abstain from every form of evil, crucify the flesh with its passions and desires, make no provision for the flesh to arouse its desires. In Romans 6, verses 6, 6 and 12 to 14, 8, verses 4 and 13, 12 to 2, 13, 14, and Galatians 5, verses 16 to 18 and 24, and 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 3 to 5 and 5, 22. Another remedy for sin, according to Paul, is fellow Christians, whom he exhorts not to place an obstacle or a trap before a brother or sister not to cause anyone to stumble, not to do anything that causes your brother to stumble, not to cause one of them to sin. In Romans 14, verses 13, 20 to 21, and 1 Corinthians 8, 13. Additionally, he exhorts other Christians to carry one another's burdens in order to prevent others and themselves from sinning further. In Galatians 6, verses 1 to 2. Paul's third remedy for sin is divine assistance which he does not describe in terms of a power encounter such as an exorcism, but in terms of divine provision, such as explaining that God will provide a way out so that you may be able to endure the temptation. 1 Corinthians 10.13 Let's compare that with the bardiology of cosmological dualism. In cosmological dualism, there is a supernatural origin of evil and sin, typically the watchers. In cosmological dualism, Sin results from deceit or possession by supernatural evil, typically demons such as Belia or Mastema. In cosmological dualism, supernatural evil is fought with exorcism, apotropaic prayer, and law observance. Clearly, Paul's homartiology is not a good fit for cosmological dualism. Now let's compare Paul's views with the homartiology of forensic dualism. In the homartiology of forensic dualism, There is a human origin of evil and sin, typically Adam and Eve. Contemporary sin results from the Yetzirah, a natural human impulse, or by temptation by humans, or failure in a divinely arranged trial. In the homartiology of forensic dualism, sin is avoided through mental self-discipline, supplicatory prayer, and law observance. That's quite clearly a much better match. On the basis of this evidence, I argue that Paul's homartiology aligns him with forensic dualism rather than cosmological dualism. I'll conclude this section with some scholarly commentary on what we find here. Torsten Lofsted writes that when Paul says we were enemies to God in Romans 5.10, quote, it is worth taking those words seriously. According to Paul, we humans were God's enemies. We were not just a battlefield in a cosmic fight between God and the devil. Susan Garrett observes how Paul is differentiated from writers who held to a cosmological dualism, explaining that by his references to sin and death, Paul suggests that there are other ways to construe the worldly agents working to thwart our devotion to God than by reference to Satan. On the other hand, we might ask is Paul attributing supernatural power? To sin and death? 
Could they be personifications of supernatural evil forces? Lofsted says he hesitates to draw this conclusion since, quote, Paul does not seem to share many of the preoccupations of his more apocalyptic contemporaries, end quote. Note that Lofsted does not deny Paul believed in some kind of satanic figure, writing that, quote, Paul takes it for granted that Satan exists, end quote. However, in Lofsted's view, Paul's understanding of Satan is not as a supernatural evil being, but more like an obedient angelic servant of God. He writes, quote, Paul assumes that Satan is under God's control, end quote, and adds, quote, although he is singularly unpleasant, Satan is still in God's employ, end quote. For Lofsted, Paul's Satan is more like the Old Testament obedient angelic figure who God sends to test his servants. Further evidence for this is that Lofsted notes the differences between Paul's homartiology and the homartiology of cosmological dualism, writing that Paul, quote, nowhere explicitly refers to Satan as the one who tempted Adam and Eve, end quote. Finally, Lofsted writes that although Paul says sin entered the world through one man, quote, he does not say it came into the world through the devil, end quote. Finally, Schumann writes that Paul's use of sin is, quote, the conspicuous peculiarity of Paul's homartiology in Romans, end quote. As many scholars have noted, whenever Paul discusses the cause of contemporary sin, he uses the word sin in ways in which other Second Temple period writers use the words Satan or the devil. This is trivial to understand from the perspective that Paul did not believe in Satan as a supernatural evil being responsible for either the entry of sin into the world or the contemporary temptation and sin of human beings, but it requires a robust explanation from the perspective that Paul did believe in such a being. Preliminary Remarks on New Testament Exorcism To start this section, I'll quote a comment Ben made in his original article. Quote, Though Paul himself nowhere describes performing an exorcism, he does talk about Satan. End quote. Note that Ben says, quote, Paul himself nowhere describes performing an exorcism. End quote. He moves on from this point immediately, but I think it's worth dwelling on. This is a curious fact which requires an explanation. I think Ben would agree that this is anomalous if Paul not only had a reputation as an exorcist, but also himself believed in demonic possession and exorcism. This is quite a loose thread, and I'd like to pull on it to see what happens. Let's collect a list of facts about Paul's view of demons and exorcism, as expressed in the letters Scholarship Agrees, are genuinely his. Firstly, the graph on screen now shows that a search for either daemonian or daemon, the two typical Greek words for a demon in the New Testament, demonstrates Paul only uses the word daemonian, and even then only four times, in 1 Corinthians 10, 20-21. I'll leave discussion of what he meant by that for the next video, but for now it's important to note how rarely he even referred to demons. Secondly, I'll expand on Ben's statement, quote, Paul himself nowhere describes performing an exorcism, end quote, by noting that Paul himself nowhere describes anyone performing an exorcism, nor does he ever diagnose anyone with demonic possession, nor does he ever speak of exorcism. And by nowhere, I mean nowhere is Paul anywhere in the New Testament described as speaking of an exorcism. Thirdly, I'll note that although Paul describes various gifts of the Spirit in 1 Corinthians 12, 8-10 and 28-30, to several of which gifts are divinely empowered abilities such as supernatural healing, performing miracles, prophesying and speaking in foreign languages without having learned them, none of these gifts refer to exorcism or demonic possession. Likewise, although Paul describes a range of congregational appointments and responsibilities, such as elders, servants, apostles, prophets, evangelists, teachers, and pastors, he never refers to exorcists. Obviously, my perspective that Paul didn't believe in supernatural evil beings like demons and evil spirits 
provides considerable explanatory power for this pattern of evidence. However, I look forward to seeing how Ben explains this from his perspective that Paul did believe in such beings. Turning from Paul to the Gospels, I'd like to notice a few anomalies there as well. Firstly, Jesus never diagnoses anyone with demonic possession. This is very curious given that such a diagnosis was not only expected of an exorcist, it was not even a specialised skill. Demonic possession was considered so obvious that even the unlearned could recognise it. Indeed, the Gospels themselves consistently identify common people performing the diagnoses and informing Jesus of what was wrong with the people they asked him to heal. Secondly, Jesus doesn't use any of the standard Second Temple period methods of exorcism. In fact, Jesus' actions are dramatic in their simplicity and freedom from the magical rituals, talismans, amulets, and apotropaic prayers of a typical Second Temple period power encounter with supernatural evil. Whatever Jesus is doing here, it certainly isn't what most people did. Thirdly, John's Gospel written considerably later than the synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, makes absolutely no reference to any exorcisms by Jesus, or even by anyone else. In fact, scholars have long noted that John's Gospel contains none of the exorcisms, demons, or evil spirits of the synoptics. Remarkably, the only references to demonic possession in John are made by Jesus' opponents, who accuse Jesus of having an evil spirit. Some explanation must be found for the fact that in John's Gospel, belief in demons, possession, and exorcism is only characterized as a belief of the enemies of Christ. This curious absence is sometimes explained as John subsuming these beings within the identity of a single satanic figure, or simply shifting the focus from Jesus' battle with Satan and demons to a more central conflict between Jesus and God's supernatural arch enemy. However, no single explanation has yet gained acceptance, and the question remains open and is regularly revisited in mainstream scholarship. Preliminary Remarks on New Testament Satan and Demons as with New Testament references to exorcism and demonic possession, there are more than a few loose threads when it comes to the New Testament treatment of Satan and demons. Firstly, as I have mentioned previously, there is a distinct absence of apotropaic prayer from the New Testament. This is extraordinary if the writers believed in supernatural evil beings. One synoptic pericope has been interpreted as at least potentially apotropaic. As we saw previously in Matthew 6.13 and Luke 11.4, when Jesus is teaching his disciples to pray, he instructs them to request of God, quote, do not lead us into temptation, deliver us from evil, end quote. Or alternatively, quote, deliver us from the evil one, end quote. The grammar of the noun used here does not differentiate between the generic reading, deliver us from evil, or the more personal, deliver us from the evil one. However, contextual considerations should question the relevance of an apotropaic interpretation. The very fact that the reference to evil here is so ambiguous differentiates it from typical apotropaic formulations, which were both explicit and specific. Professor Benjamin Wald warns that, quote, apotropaic should not be used so loosely as to include vague requests to avert personal dangers, but rather it should be used to describe a petition to God to ward off an evil spirit. End quote. I'll have more to say on this in the next video, but for now it's enough to point out that if one verse in Matthew and Luke is the best evidence for apotropaic prayer in the New Testament, then I think that speaks for itself. Secondly, although Second Temple period literature uses a range of different words for specific satanic figures, such as Shemihaza, Mastima, Melchiresha, Asahel, and most commonly Belial or Beliah, the New Testament avoids almost all of these. In the New Testament, various members of the Jewish religious elite use the name 
Beelzebul or Beelzebub. Yet out of all the names used in the Second Temple Period literature, Belia only occurs once in Paul. Additionally, the name Beelzebul only appears in the Gospels and almost invariably in the mouths of Jesus' opponents. In fact, Jesus even seems to be deliberately avoiding this word, choosing to substitute it with Satan in conversation with his opponents, and only using it when he is quoting them directly. Why does the New Testament avoid all of the well-established names for supernatural evil opponents of God and humans, and instead use words which in the Second Temple period literature are overwhelmingly not proper names, but are instead common nouns which can refer to a range of different adversarial figures, including an obedient angel of God, human opponents, or the innate human tendency to sin. Thirdly, there are references to Satan in both the Gospels and Paul's letters, which are highly incongruous if we understand Jesus and Paul to believe in a single supernatural evil being called Satan. In Matthew 4, 1, Mark 1, 12 to 13, and Luke 4, 1 to 2, Jesus is said to have spent time in the wilderness being tempted by Satan or the devil. However, in each case, the Gospel writer states explicitly that Jesus was led there by the Holy Spirit. This is clearly a critical feature of the wilderness temptation narrative since it appears in each of the synoptic accounts, despite the fact that they differ in other details, sometimes significantly. Why would God's Holy Spirit lead the Son of God into the wilderness to be left at the mercy of God's most fearsome supernatural enemy? In addition to this, there are two curious passages in Paul's letters. In 1 Corinthians 5, 4-5, he tells the Corinthian congregation to discipline a wayward Christian with the words, quote, Turn this man over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. End quote. The precise meaning of this instruction has always been a considerable challenge for believers in traditional views of Satan. Exactly why would Paul suggest delivering a sinful Christian to Satan? Exactly how would this result in the destruction of their flesh? And exactly how would this result in their ultimate salvation? It is clear Paul is speaking of some kind of disciplinary measure which is for the benefit of the Christian who has gone astray. So how is Satan a part of this? In 2 Corinthians 12, 7-8, Paul says that in order to prevent him becoming arrogant, he was given what he refers to as, quote, a thorn in the flesh, end quote, a phrase so vigorously evocative it has entered the English language as an idiom. Paul refers to this as, quote, a messenger of Satan, end quote. Yet he says he, quote, asked the Lord three times about this, that it would depart from me, end quote. As with the previous passage, commentators have historically struggled with this reference. The word translated messenger is literally the Greek word angelos, typically used in the New Testament for angel, though it basically does mean a messenger of any kind. Translators hesitate to render it angel here, since whatever the messenger of Satan is, Paul clearly implies it was sent by God. The United Bible Society Handbook for Translators states, quote, Most interpreters agree that the implicit agent of the verb was given is probably God, end quote. Adding that, quote, Whether God or Satan is understood as the agent, Paul at least believes that God permitted it, as in the case of Job in the Old Testament, end quote. Notably, the purpose of this messenger is totally benign a means of preventing Paul falling into the sin of pride. The idea that Satan would send one of his own angels to stop Paul becoming sinfully prideful seems absurd, but no less absurd than the idea of God himself sending one of Satan's angels for the same purpose. Yet, if Satan here refers to a supernatural evil being, then translating the word angelos with the generic word messenger only alleviates the tension very slightly since it does not explain why a corrective measure sent by God would be described as a messenger of Satan. Whatever this passage means, 
it fits very uneasily into a traditional cosmological dualism in which Satan is a supernatural evil being. Conclusion With the second temple period socio-cultural context established in these two videos, we're now ready to examine specific New Testament references to Satan, the devil, demons, and evil spirits. The next video will address these questions. 1. Does the New Testament have a monolithic Satanology and demonology? 2. How did Jesus understand Satan and demons? 3. How did Paul understand Satan and demons? Coincidentally, I was delighted to see just today, on September 14th, a new article relevant to this discussion published by Professor Tom de Bruin, lecturer in New Testament exegesis and early Christian literature, who is very well published in this field. I was particularly interested to see that de Bruin made exactly the same point I had expressed in my 2016 academic paper. De Bruin writes that there is what he refers to as a, quote, recurring trend, end quote, to, quote, assume or argue for a monolithic image of Satan throughout the New Testament, end quote. However, he argues, quote, such a uniform New Testament Satanology is untenable. There is only evidence of New Testament Satanologies, end quote. In de Bruin's view, the New Testament writers, quote, continue the second temple trend of diverse Satan traditions, and any examination of Satan should keep this front and centre, end quote. If you're wondering exactly how I'm going to address specific New Testament passages citing Satan and demons, you can consider de Bruin's article broadly indicative of my own approach. If you find this video of interest, please like and share it, and leave a comment or question if you feel inclined.